Mr. Fredericks, I'll remind you you're still under oath. Thank you. Okay. vector analysis and frame rate analysis, just to name a few, is that correct? Yes. Regarding the frame rate, what would happen to the accuracy of the timing from image to image if someone were to import the original video into an editing system such as Apple Final Cut Pro, Adobe Premiere Pro, or Avid Media Composer? Any non-linear editing system, systems such as all those mentioned and uh, programs that allow someone to edit video, when they import video with a variable image refresh rate that we talked about yesterday, it forces an average, so it completely strips out all of the reference to timing from image to image, and it essentially fabricates a, a uh, false representation of time. So these systems generally have what's called project settings. They can set the project to 29.97 frames per second, 30, or 59, or 60. Those are kind of the limitations. So when you import a variable image refresh rate system, it will just standardize the timing. So you lose all reference for time. Thank you, sir. And um, to go back to yesterday, to bring us up to date, please play the video from the moment the defendant reaches towards the door until he yells stop for the first time. Well, I thought I'd to figure out if you have a license or not. Go ahead and take your seatbelt off for me. Go ahead and take your seatbelt off. At this point in the video, you testified that Mr. Tenzing had yelled to stop once. And it was the vehicle in motion at this point in time. No. Tell us what you relied upon to tell us that the vehicle is not in motion. Um, there are a number of uh, observations that we can make about the video about the position of the vehicle, the position of uh, Mr. Tensing, uh, that tells us that at this moment in time the vehicle is not in motion. As um, Mr. Tensing is approaching the vehicle, there are marks on the roadway that we can observe. This is blur um, uh, This is motion blur, basically the blurriness because of the compression. But occasionally we get observations we can make. There's a line across the roadway that I'm pointing to that comes and goes as we move toward it. But this is, it actually stays in the same position, just about at the position of the front of the tire. So we can see that crack in the road, and that crack in the road is there today um, uh, still. So this, we can make this observation. What I'll do is I'll go to um, the document, the observations document that we looked at, and I'll just go to a point where the activity occurs. So we can see at this point 1.2 seconds before the shot's fired, right about the time that he's about to yell stop, or he has, is yelling stop, I'll just give you a reference for that. So the stop is yelled at 316.224 and at 315.8, so about 400 milliseconds later, less than half a second later, or before that, pardon me, we see the line at the same position. So that basically establishes just from that single observation that there is no forward momentum from the car from the time that it was stopped initially in the traffic stop until this moment in time. So we have that observation we can make. The other observation is the one that we look to in the background, which shows that um, at 1.5 at seconds, the background has not changed. The relationship to um, the features in the background are the same. 
Uh, likewise, at 1.4 seconds, there's still no movement from the background. Uh, and at one, one second, there's no movement from the background. So that, that's another observation that establishes a consistency with the background as we're looking through the vehicle. There would be a perspective change on everything in the background had the vehicle moved forward at, at that time. Uh, just slightly before this, we have the reflection of Mr. Tensing's legs in the doorway where he's separated from, from the vehicle and his feet are in the same basic position that we see. And I'm going back to 2.2 seconds where we see his foot stationary on the ground, the reflection of his body that we can track. So that's another observation that we can make. So up to one second before uh, the shot's fired, uh, there is no forward momentum. And at least those three observations um, uh, validate for us that that observation is correct. Okay, thank you. Now, um, could you please play the video from after the first stop and up until the shot is fired? I'm at the one second mark before the shot's fired right now, and I'll play it from here. It tells that that was, you're saying that's one second? About 1.1 seconds, yes. Now between the first stop and the shot's fired, um, and that 1.1 second, does the vehicle move? Yes. What do you base your determination on? Um, when I went out to the scene and made some observations, but I'll just, I'll go back to this slide for a moment and demonstrate. Uh, this is 1.4 seconds. We still have the same background. Um, we're at 1.1 seconds where we see the same background. Um, we're basically one second, so this is where we are. We can confirm at one second and 59 thousandths of a second, no motion. We then lose continuity of the background. Because of the motion in the camera, we don't see the mark on the roadway. So I have to assume at this point, I can't say when exactly the car starts to move, but at the time of the shot, we begin to see a change in the shape of the vehicle in the background. So in other words, if I'm looking at the side of a vehicle that's facing toward me, I'll have a perspective um, under the vehicle uh, uh, and to the left side. And as I move more toward the vehicle or this way, then the, the angle of the vehicle is going to change. So that's what we're beginning to see as a slight angle change. Um, here. So this indicates to me that there's been, within that one second period, there's been forward momentum. This is 100 milliseconds, 178 milliseconds before the shot's fired, and I can see a slight change. As we move forward after the shot's fired, um, again I'm detecting a little bit more change, but we're not yet past the left side of the vehicle, the, the driver's side. As we move forward, um, we can still see we're still not, this is after the shot's fired, we're still not at the center of the vehicle yet. I can still see light between the front left, front right tire and the back right tire. Once we're basically dead center on this, we'll lose that light because the angle will change and we'll see basically be aligned with all the tires. That has not happened yet. And as we move forward, we, we get to about this position um, uh, where we're pretty much online with the car. But this is after the shot is fired. So to get there to the point where the shot, the shot would be fired to this position here, the movement would be very slight. And um, I have an image of the driveway that kind of gives us some reference for that. Okay. Um, and I think it's in as one of the exhibits in the case. Right. Yes. Can you share that to us? Um, this is uh, image number 
uh, DSC7324. Uh, I'm not sure what the exhibit number is. It, it's an exhibit number at this time. I can't tell you which one it is, but it has been entered as an exhibit. Okay. <clears throat> so go ahead, I'm sorry. Yes. So the, the front of the vehicle is stopped in line with this um, line of the, of the cement about right here. Uh, Officer Tensing is standing in about this position between, at the driver's door. The position that the vehicle is in at the time of the shot is we can still see the left side of this vehicle. So it's the Officer Tensing would have moved from about this position, I'm going to move to the left, to roughly this position. So that's the movement that would still give us the perspective of the left side of that vehicle. So this is a, just a few feet. Now, Mr. Bridgers, in that, in that last clip you played, you could also hear the sound of a vehicle engine. What comment do you have about that? Um, we hear the ignition start. We see the ignition start. Um, at about that time, um, and just slightly after that, we hear the sound of a car engine. But there are two cars there. There's a car that is driving toward the parked vehicle, and as the shot is fired, the, the, the car is virtually, um, they're, they're going by each other. Uh, the car that is coming is obviously going faster. We hear a sound of a car engine at that time. Um, there's, there's no way for me to determine or forensically for anybody to determine which car we're listening to. Objection. It's, um, I've listened to that car engine. Uh, it's my opinion that without being able to, the way that we would test uh, which sound, which engine was causing that sound, is to do tests on that engine and on the other engine. Not just this vehicle of the same kind. You'd have to know the speeds that both vehicles were going. There's no foundation for that. So from a forensic digital multimedia evidence examination perspective, there is no method that is currently um, known that would allow us to take two different vehicles and reconstruct the sounds to determine which vehicle it's coming from. And can you tell us, um, within the audio, were you able to hear, when you hear the car engine, did you hear the sound of any squirrely tires? No. I'm sorry. No. Can you describe just briefly um, how the mic on the body worn camera works? The, the microphone on the um, Taser Axon camera is an, what's called an omnidirectional microphone. It's designed to capture sounds from as a, a wide range, but immediately in front or immediately uh, um, within the perspective of the camera. Sounds that are behind um, the camera will be a little bit harder to hear. Sounds that are on the side will be easier to hear and sounds directly in front will be quite audible. They're designed to pick up conversations like this. Um, the closer you are, the better it's going to be. Um, they have a frequency of sensitivity. They're sensitive to frequencies um, in the low spectrum, through the, the voice spectrum, and to very high frequencies. So they're, they're very adaptable. Um, they're, they certainly have much more sensitivity than a human ear that is a distance away. Sir, yesterday um, we discussed the location of the uh, defendant's camera on his person. Can you please show an image that would display that um, to better illustrate to the jury? I'm showing an image from Officer Kidd's video at 4 minutes 49.472 seconds. There's a magnified view here that I've provided that shows the position of um, where Officer Tensing was wearing the camera. Um, I've used this image to do my measurement of approximately 13 inches from his eye to the lens, which is right where I'm pointing. And then I examined these two images together uh, 
to um, make the observation of where the camera perspective is in relation to where the gun is, in relation to where his eyes are. And in this observation, the camera is facing uh, the, the center of the image. It's below the gun, which, which then demonstrates that the gun is higher and in front of Mr. Tensing, and that his head is higher than the gun. Can we look at slide 115? Yes. Thank you. Um, do you have any comment from your um, analysis as to what direction the tires are facing in this image? Because of the perspective, it's very difficult to tell. Um, what we would want, for instance, if the tire were facing turned to the right, the back end of the tire would stick out from the car. At this point, we don't see the back end of the tire. It's, it's behind the um, bodywork of the car. So we don't really get a perspective if it's turned to the left, how much it's turned to the left. We see the front of the tire, but not the back, which would indicate that it's not straightforward, otherwise we would see part of the tire sticking out. We also look at the steering wheel. The steering wheel appears to be turned to the left. It's not, this is the tree that goes across from the upper part to the lower part, which would add some support to the observation that there is probably a slight turn to the tire. That's the best that we can say uh, about it, this image, that there's, we don't see the back of the tire. So um, we do see the front of the tire. The turn of the wheel gives some support for the fact that it's likely turned slightly left. Thank you. Now, sir, do you recall anywhere in the finished statement where he stated Mr. DeBose was holding his hand against the steering wheel of a Honda? That Mr. DeBose was ha holding Mr. Tensing's hand. Correct. No, that's not, I didn't read that in the statement. Okay. Did you see any image in the, sh in the video that shows Mr. DeBose pinning the defendant's hand? No. Did you see an image of the defendant's hand stuck in the steering wheel? No. How long did this entire event um, last from? the opening of the door until the shot fired, or the attempt to open the door and the shot fired. The, the event from saying, uh, take off the seat belt, then Officer Tensing moves toward the car, begins to open the car until the shot's fired, is around eight seconds. The event of um, reaching t uh, forward um, toward the front of the steering wheel until his hand is now moving toward the chest is about 0 0.4 seconds, and I can play that. Okay, thank you. So, again, I'll go back. This image is right when his hand is moving into the door. I described earlier that because of the motion, there's some motion blur. We really can't tell because of the motion blur um, what's happening with the two hands. So all I can say is that within 0 0.4 seconds, <laughs> Officer Tensing's hand is at, at the chest area. So there's no image of being pinned and we have full continuity now of his hand pretty much throughout the rest of it until the shot's fired. So um, in that 0 0.4 seconds, I can't say exactly what's occurring. Thank you. But that's a pretty quick clip there. 0 0.4 seconds is really, it's, just, it's all motion blur. It means that the motion is in and over to the side. Thank you. And sir, what does the video show that the defendant did immediately after the shot was fired? Immediately after the shot was fired, um, he 
Officer Tenzin releases his grip on the seat belt. As the car is moving forward, his left forearm goes onto the door, the, the threshold where the window would come up. The, the camera sees the hand on the door. His hand is very close to the B post. As the car begins to move forward, the camera perspective then goes toward the back of the car, which would indicate that his chest is moving toward the back of the vehicle and downward. We get a glimpse of his feet in front of his body. He releases from the car, uh, goes backward onto the ground. We see the other vehicle at the same position. Again, we're, we're talking milliseconds through, throughout this. He turns to uh, his right, he stands up. We then get this from Officer Kidd's uh, body worn video. We see this activity. He gets up and he turns and pursues the car. Sorry. That's Is that the. Officer Kidd or Lyndon Schmitz? Uh, Officer Lyndon Schmitz, I'm sorry. Um, so both uh, Officer Tenzing and Officer Lyndon Schmitz's cameras record the event of him getting up off the ground and then pursuing the vehicle. His own body worn video shows the release of his left hand from the seat belt. The, hand, the arm is on the, the vehicle. The camera perspective changes toward the, the side and rear of the vehicle. Within 100 to 200 milliseconds after the shot's fired, his perspective goes down to his feet. Uh, we then see the other vehicle as he begins to turn to his right. We see the other vehicle is right there. You see his, um, uh, he's got control of his firearm, so the firearm is in front of him. He gets up, turns, and then pursues, <laughs> pursues and then we have, um, he goes over to the, to the vehicle and there's some other activity. Thank you, Mr. Frederick. I have no further questions. Mr. Matthews, cross his hand. <clears throat> Mr. Fredericks, just so there's no confusion here, you are being paid by the state of Ohio to analyze that video and offer your opinions, is that correct? Yes, I am. And do you know how many hours you have devoted to this project, roughly? No, I don't. Can you estimate? I, I can't. Have you ever seen the movie Sully? About Captain Chesley Sullenberger who landed the airplane in the middle of the Hudson River full of people? Yeah, I did, yes. Yeah. You know what 2020 hindsight is? I do. What is that? <coughs> if I could have done it over again, I would have. Um, 2020 hindsight is like Monday morning quarterbacking, is it not? It's when you look back at something that occurred and analyze it and determine whether somebody did something wrong. Well, Monday morning quarterbacking in hindsight is if I'd known something at that time, I would not have done what I did. Yes. And the United States Supreme Court has ruled that you can't use 2020 hindsight when you're analyzing a situation such as this. Do you agree with that? Well, I've, I've never heard that term of forensic capacity. I think if somebody were a Monday morning quarterback sitting at home without doing a forensic analysis, I probably would agree with you. So you don't consider yourself a Monday morning quarterback using 2020 hindsight to tell these ladies and gentlemen what's depicted in that less than three seconds of video. No, because this is real information, as opposed to conjecture, what if, I wish I had done something differently. This is actually a forensic examination of fact. And would you agree that others may look at that same video and have a different interpretation of what's depicted in it? That is the nature of an adversarial system like this, um, where I would expect that, that you would have somebody present a different perspective, and it certainly is your duty to do that. So I would expect that, yes. And are you telling the ladies and gentlemen of the jury that you've never been wrong? Um, I believe when I, I don't know of a case where I've been wrong when I've testified. Um, it, you know, you don't know what you don't know. Um, and uh, uh, I have, um, I have never had a case where somebody has demonstrated a different perspective where I said, oh yeah, you know, I made a mistake. So no, I'm very cautious with my examinations and my evidence. Um, I'm very clear about, 
for instance, the, the issue of what happened when he moved his hand in there. I said, I can't tell you definitively that there was no pinning, but whatever occurred, occurred in 0 0.04 seconds. Um, okay, well, let's move on. Yes. Do you agree that the, the body-worn camera that you demonstrated to the jury records what the camera sees, correct? No, not necessarily. The, Tell me where I'm wrong about that. Okay, so the video, the camera is a, is a light receiver. It receives reflection of light. Technically, we call it photon energy. There's a, what's called a charge-coupled device, a CCD, behind the lens. That device interprets the light information, and, and we have the curvature so I, that I talked about. It's then encoded. And the camera... I don't mean to catch you off, but I don't understand all this. Well, well, let me finish, please. The camera itself is seeing a constant display of information. The encoder is what assigns the timing. So we have to look at the timing correctly. So if you're saying that the camera, you know, the camera sees a constant frequency of information, the encoder changes that timing. So we have to assist in the understanding of that timing. That's one example of where it might not be completely accurate that, that the camera records everything that the lens sees. Well, so are you telling me that the video that you presented here is not completely accurate? No, the video I have presented is accurate. Well, I've, I heard you yesterday testify that, and again, I didn't understand the technical aspect of it, but that the video shoots a frame and then fills in gaps on the next few frames or something like that. Is that all, right? all MPEG video uses um, prediction where it can repeat data. All MPEG video does that. Every CCTV camera in the world does that. The ones in the courtroom, same thing. So a forensic video analyst needs to understand that to see whether or not that has an effect on the accurate understanding of what is actually happening at that moment in time. So I have to evaluate all that. And I took that into consideration. So my observations, my analysis, took that into consideration. And you, that's forensics 101. Um, you talked many law enforcement personnel about, about video cameras, correct? Yes, I, uh, both law enforcement and private, yes. And that would refer to both uh, dash cam videos in cruisers and body-worn cameras, correct? That's correct. And have you ever told them that uh, they should not ever rely solely on what is shown on a body camera video? You, you definitely, my, my belief and my training is that um, the, the videos, we, there's an old adage that the video is the silent witness, an image is worth a thousand words, that it speaks for itself. It's a very dangerous concept. And I, and I hope that in this examination, that when you look at it, I've been able to assist you to better understand the video to understand the frailties of timing, those kinds of things. So my training is never take it on its face value. Examine it carefully. Understand it thoroughly. Because if you don't, again, you do not know what you do not know. So carefully look at the technology. If you understand how it was created, you can understand what it, what it means. Am I hearing you say that the video is not 100% reliable? Well, it is reliable if it's properly examined. And so I can assure you that I have presented it in a reliable manner that you can rely on the observations that I've provided. Yeah, I've heard you say before that digital recordings are designed to fool the human eye. Is that a fair statement? Yes. They are designed by the nature of compression to give, and, and recording, to give the illusion of full motion. So every image, even the images we see on television, we get about 60 images per second on television. They're still still images. They're held for you to observe until the image is refreshed. So every 16.7 milliseconds, an image is being held for you. You have no, no uh, there's no record of what occurs between that moment in time and the next 16.7 milliseconds. I'll give you an example, please. Doing ballistic tests to see a bullet come out of the, the, the front of a gun. We want to see the rotation of that bullet out of the gun. You have to record that at about 8,000 images per second to get that rotation. If you just record it with a regular camera, you don't see it. So 
Um, I have stood uh, on a um, uh, on a uh, shooting range, and I've seen in uh, these are practice rounds that have a very low velocity of about 900 feet per second. I can see the projectile going going from behind the gun to the target. I can see more than a camera can. Camera can't record that information because I can perceive more stuff. So, so the issue of whether it's accurate, it's accurate provided that we understand its limitations. It wouldn't be accurate to record the projectile. It's not what it's designed to do. It's designed to, to give a representation of what occurred at the scene. That's a thorough response. I'll try to keep it shorter. Thank you. Um, you indicated that you can see a bullet. With your own eyes, well, right? these are these are uh, practice loads that have a lower velocity that I have experience where I can see the bullet going. Yes. Would you agree with me then that what you see through your eyes is often different than what the camera records? Yes. And the fact that I, if I heard you say it once yesterday, I heard you say it twenty times that this camera that Ray Kenzie was wearing on July nineteenth was. Uh, I believe you said 13 inches below his eyes, correct? That's correct. So you don't know what you saw from 13 inches above that camera, correct? I don't have a record of it. We just have a record of what happened 13 inches below his eyes. And, and you indicated, I believe, that the, the camera is firmly attached to his chest, correct? Yes. Does that mean it doesn't move? No. Uh, does that mean that that 13 inches is always 13 inches no matter what? Well, it's fixed to the chest, and if the shirt has some movement to it, there would be some movement to the camera. And how about if the head or neck has some movement to it, such as down, or back, or sideways? Yes, the, the perspective of the human eye is not the perspective of the camera. So that 13 inches that you refer to over and over again is, is meaningless. Do you agree with that? No, it's critical because the description that Officer Tenzing provided in his statement was that his eyes were below the door. If his eyes were below the door, the camera would be 13 inches lower than that, and it never occurred. Okay, you indicated in one discussion I heard you participate in that officers sometimes misinterpret situations, and you were brought in to rehabilitate the officer. Remember ever making that statement? Can you give me a reference, please? Um, this would be a lexical point counterpoint production. Not too long ago. Yeah, that was a webinar that I yes. took part in in body worn video um, issues. And I, I think the reference for that was that a police officer, we have a big national um, uh, discussion going on right now. The question is should a police officer review their video? prior to, to um, providing a statement. My experience is that police officers will often misinterpret the video. They'll see something in the video, they'll then say, oh, that must have happened. And because of the timing changes in video, they'll often misinterpret force issues. And many times the officer will look at a partner's camera and they'll get confused about what in reality occurred and they'll start giving evidence about what they saw, but it was actually from a perspective they could not possibly have seen it. And it's not, in a lot of cases, a nefarious thing where they're trying to make stuff up. They just get confused. We call it video memory. So the discussion is, sometimes the, the, the recommendation is don't look at your video because you may invent information that didn't occur. There's a danger in doing that, and that's what that conference is about. You, you indicated in that conference that you were sometimes hired to rehabilitate the officer, correct? Well, I don't recall that word, but my intent by that is to assist the officer to accurately understand what the video showed. And if they want to retract statements, uh, change their memory based on that interpretation, you know, that's up to them. The problem is, of course, when you make a statement and then you try to change it later because the facts don't bear out. And you were brought into this case to help Gray Tenzin, correct? In fact, it was just the opposite. If I was, well, no. I would, I would okay. reject that statement. Just the, the, 
I was asked to interpret the video. Excuse me, I'm just, let me answer your question. Go ahead. I was asked to assist in understanding the video and provide information, accurate information to the trier of fact. If I worked for you, sir, on this case, I would have done exactly the same thing. And would it be a fair statement on my part that in the split second or the, the two or three seconds this incident occurred, um, Ray Tenzin could very well have misperceived exactly what occurred? Have you experienced that? Well, you're asking, sorry, let me understand. Are you saying if he had seen the video or not seen the video? Either way. Could he have misinterpreted the events at the time? I mean, I'm, that's outside my area of expertise. I have an opinion, but it's outside my area of expertise. Okay. Mr. Fredericks, we know that Ray Tenzing saw the video before he gave his statement, which you saw at Cincinnati Police Department, correct? Yes. And we know that according to your analysis of this video, his hand was never caught in the steering wheel, correct? That's correct. And we know that Ray Tenzing, despite having seen the video before he gave his statement, he continued to say that his arm was caught in or was tangled in the steering wheel. That's correct. Okay, and now can you explain why he would stay with that perception that his arm was caught in the steering wheel when he had had an opportunity to see the same video that you've analyzed? I apologize, it's an unusual question. I don't think it'd be fair to the defendant for me to answer that question. Okay, I'll take that. Now you've, you've shown on your, one of your slide by slide or frame by frame uh, programs up there on the, on the screen, all the images have little clipped edges, like somebody took a pair of scissors and cut the edges off. Yes. And you've indicated that that's so that you can flatten out the images, correct? Well, I didn't use the term flatten out. That's a calibration of a um, fisheye lens. When that calibration occurs, the result is that the image, when it becomes calibrated, it, it does everything, it basically is an, a, a correction, but because the edges are so um, uh, curved, that's the, that's the result that you always get. If you call it a correction, would alteration be another word to apply to it? That's not a, that's not a, a term uh, that we use in forensics. It's it, because it's a process that is repeated, that can be repeated by any other expert with the same tools and qualifications. Um, the same process is applied to every image, so it, it is exactly the same. So we're not altering it, we're correcting it, calibrating it. Um, would you agree with me that the camera, and I think you've already probably answered this, does not see what Ray Tensing saw? I would agree that, that Ray Tensing would have a different perspective than the camera would have. And would you agree with me that that little camera doesn't have a brain in it or any feelings in it? Yes. Such as Ray Tensing would have? I would agree. I agree. Would you agree that those type of things all have to be considered in, in making a decision on whether or not what Ray Tenzing did on July 19th, 2015 was justified? I agree. Thank you. Judge, I had previously had a separate frame-by-frame -frame, uh, DVD mark as well as Defendant's Exhibit 4. I would like to show the frames on the uh, screen.
to Mr. Fredericks and ask him to comment if I could. Uh, Mr. They've been previously furnished with a copy. Okay. Would you agree with that? I would like at this point to show you, um, again, I have, just for the record, we have made our own frame-by-frame -frame, uh, copy of the video, and it has different numbers than yours because I think the starting point is different. I would like to go through some of those with you. That's okay. Yes. Frame one, and I would like to ask you to look at that tire down there. And I believe you previously opined that you can't tell whether that is turned right, left, or straight. As I as I said, um, I I don't have an opinion as to whether that tire is turned right, left, or straight. The observation that I think is important to make is that we don't see the back of the tire. If it were turned right, let me, let me correct that. If it were turned right, we would see the back of the tire. We could then know it was turned to the right. The only, what I'm looking at is we don't see the back of the tire, so we can't really know. We look to the steering wheel, we see the steering wheel turned to the left. That may give some opportunity to, to uh, make the observation and then decide, decide what that means to you. And of course, if that steering wheel is turned a little bit to the left. You don't know anything about that either because you don't know about the mechanics of the steering system on the car with 170,000 miles. That is absolutely correct, yes. Now, up here, you see that car parked there, correct? I do, yes. And that remained there during this entire incident? It did. So this car, driven by Sam DeBose, would have had to go left to go around that park, correct? Would have to avoid hitting it? Um, no. Uh, when I was at the scene, there's a grade in the road. If the vehicle uh, had a slight turn in the tire, as it went straight with that slight turn, uh, the vehicle could go by that car. In fact, from officer, um, we could show it, or I've got it, I think it's, it's been entered. There's an image from officer Linda Schmidt's camera right as the DeBose vehicle is passing that car. It's just past it. It's very, very close. So um, my observation is based on the positioning of the vehicle, the potential that there's a slight turn in the car, and the car could have gone forward and missed that vehicle. And if it continued in that same direction, uh, it would have impacted where it impacted. Of course, you never conducted any tests to determine whether that theory of yours is correct. Well, I, in essence, I did. I went back to the scene. I stood both at the position of the front right uh, uh, part of the vehicle. I stood at where the um, impact occurred. I know where that vehicle was parked because of the features on the, on the ground. I could see a direct line that um, would make it possible for the vehicle to have been driven by somebody who was incapacitated, not driving the car, and go straight from from that position uh, to the impact position. Okay, now, this car up here is the car that we, a few seconds later, a couple seconds later, see coming down, barely missing Ray Timsey as he's in the street, correct? Well, that car is on the right-hand side of the road. Uh, Officer Lineagement's camera shows that Ray Tensing is at the center of the road when he gets off the ground. Um, so, uh, the, the, car, um, uh, the car drives, Officer Tenzing doesn't go on the other side of the road before he lets go of the car. He remains at the center. So that car would have driven by at any point and not struck the officer. I didn't ask that. I just asked if that's the car that came down the hill. <laughs> well, you said and it's close to the officer, so I, so I wanted to make sure I was clear in my question. That is the vehicle that drove by, yes. Mr. Fredericks, can we agree that the sun's shining out there? Yes. Thank you. 
can agree on something anyway, correct? Yes, sir. Could you go ahead, Peggy? Just one by one, please. Okay. Here we note Officer Tenzing's right hand on the roof of the car, correct? Yes. Here, from the body camera video, Tenzing's back at the B post, B pillar, and we see the roof of the car, correct? Yes, he's slightly behind the, the B post, yes. Okay. Let's go ahead. Here, he begins to reach for the car door, correct? Well, this is all one image that we have, we, we're looking at. All on one image? This is all one picture we've seen. This isn't a second image. As the picture's being adjusted, it's merely going up in the air. We're not seeing a new image. Okay, now you've lost me. You, you asked the assistant to go to the next image? Yes. We haven't. We've just simply gone up in the image. Okay, is this, are we not showing the entire image? This, this camera is recording at 30 frames per second. Is that accurate? Approximately. It's an average. This, would you agree that's a different frame there? No, it's not. Well, how is the, the hand more visible? Because the image has moved up in the screen. Keep going, baby. Okay, now it's moving, the hand is moving forward. Okay. Different image. That different image now, yeah. Mr. Bose appears to be turning his head toward Ray Tenzing at that point? Yes. And can you, do you know from having watched the video whether the car has been started? Not been started yet. Not been started yet. Do you know where the keys are at that point? Uh, he had the key in his hand um, to open the glove compartment. Uh, I'd have to review again. I don't know if he put it back into the ignition or if it's down close to his lap. I'm not sure. Can you pause there? Can you tell here whether or not the door has started to open? I know that it uh, had started to open at some point here, I think just before this. Okay, and this is obviously Mr. DeBose with his left hand. Yes. Starting to pull the door shut. Would you agree with that? Correct. Thank you. Please go. Can you tell what he's doing with his right hand here as we progress forward? He's reaching toward the ignition. I can tell that his left hand is still on the door handle, his right hand is still on top of the car. Can you tell what Mr. DeBose is doing right there? His arm is moving uh, toward uh, the ignition um, uh, in a manner consistent with having access to the ignition control of the keys. Consistent with starting the car, beginning He's to start the car? About to start the car, yes. Now, would this indicate that Officer Tenzing is beginning to move his body? Yes. And that would be more toward forward of the B pillar, correct? Yes. this point, Officer Tenzing begins to reach in with his left hand toward the steering wheel. Would you agree with that? Yes. Continue. Stop, please. At this point, that would appear to me to be Sam DeBose's 
left arm, correct? Yes. And that is reaching toward Officer Kensing's right arm, correct? I wouldn't phrase it that way because then I would have to know what was in his mind. Um, all I can say is that his, his left arm comes up and his hands open. Would you agree that that is Officer Kensing's left arm in front of Mr. DeBose's left arm? Yes. And would you agree that they are moving toward the steering? Both. Um, I think if we progress further, we'll see some more movement. But this image, if we can just go back one, please. Go forward one image. Thank you. So this is motion blur. Um, we can't know from this image. Let me interrupt for a minute. Yes, sir. Say this is motion blur. Yes. Is that caused by movement of the camera, movement of the car, movement of Tenzing's body? Can you tell? Yes. It's caused by movement of the camera, primarily. Um, partly movement of the body, but primarily movement of the camera. Okay. Go ahead. What, would you like me to go forward here again? Yes, sir. Okay. We'll go back one, if you could. Okay. Up to this point, we see again... Sam DeBose's left hand apparently reaching toward Ray Tenzing's left arm, correct? Well, again, um, that would imply intent. I don't know if his intent was to reach toward or was he reaching upward. I, I, I can't say from this image. Let's go forward. In this image, it appears, again, it's very blurry, but it appears that Sam DeBose is looking directly at Ray Tenzing, correct? Yes. And you, can you see his left forearm down here? Yes, it appears not to have moved over the past couple of images, so his hand is in that position still, hand up in the air, elbow bent, and extended. So in those last, I guess, three images, hand comes up and, they, and his position hasn't changed. Can you tell where Ray Tenzing's left forearm is in that image? Um, I can see where his left hand is, but not where his left forearm is, necessarily. Again, from, would, would that be what you're referring to as his left hand? Yes, it is. And the steering wheel is all right in there, too, is it not? The top, uh, we're seeing the top edge of the steering wheel. Um, I could point to it, but I'm sure you can see it. Um, would you like me to point to it? Sure. Pointed to the area of the steering wheel. Please go forward. Stop, please. Okay, in this image, first of all, you still, still see Sam DeBose's left forearm, correct? Right. Can you see any part of Ray Ten? Can you de decipher any part of Ray Tenzing in that image? I, I can't from this image, no. Down here, there's two black things I assume are images of Ray Tenzing's legs, correct? Yes, his left leg is on the left side because of the mirrored image. The right leg is moving backward and is on his right side. And is that an actual image of his legs or are those shadows? That's a reflection, not a shadow. Reflection, okay. Yes. And what does this indicate right in here? The curvature of the car, it would cause a curvature of the leg, but we can see lower down on the leg, that means it's further away from the vehicle than the left leg. So it's, compared to the earlier images of that reflection, his right leg has moved backward, his left leg has stayed pretty much in the same position. Can you tell from there that his right foot, the right heel is raised? No, I can't tell whether if it's on the ground, up in the air or moving back, can't say. Please go forward. Please stop, please. Can you tell what is happening in here? Yes. Um, Mr. Tensing's hand is uh, on the left side. That would be right here? Yes. And okay. it's 
this is what we looked at was that 0.4 second event. Now the hand is moving toward the chest. And can you tell what Sam Lebose is doing with his right arm hand? I, I believe it's at the area of the ignition. In a, in a moment, we'll see it move toward the steering wheel, um, but it's at the area of the uh, ignition. Does it appear that it's dropping toward the center console gear shift there? I, I would say that's the area of the ignition, the gear shift, yes. Okay, and with his left arm, what is happening with that? Basically, it hasn't moved that I could tell from the position where it was open um, as Officer Tensing was reaching in. All these images show the position of the arm not to have moved um, in that less than half second event. And Officer Tensing's arm is still somewhere between the end of Sam DeBose's left arm hand and the steering wheel. Would that be correct assessment on my part? Well, it's possible that his arm is above Tensing's hand, but I, I really, we can't know from this image. Please go forward. Now we begin to see more rearward. Would you agree with that? Yes. And can you explain how that happened? Yes, the center of the camera, the center of his chest, is facing the B post. So somehow Officer Tenzing has begun to turn to his right. Would that be a fair statement on my part? That's consistent with the observation of the right leg moving backward, yes. And at this point... And, 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 sorry, and the reach forward. So you've got the reach forward, which causes the chest to move, and you've got the step backward with the right foot. The reach forward being with his left arm. That's correct. And at this point, it's your testimony the car hasn't begun to move. It has not begun to move, yes. Has it started? Yes. Thank you. Please go forward. Stop, please. Can you tell, based on this frame, whether or not Officer Tenzing's position has changed as far as whether he's standing or beginning to fall, um, or kneeling, or anything? Um, what we can say about this image is that the position of his chest is above the door, looking down. We'll see the gun come in in a moment. So we know that, that his arm, left arm's in motion, his right arm's in motion, the level of the camera doesn't change very much between here and the shot, so there's no, there's no indication that he's falling or, or going to the ground. His, his chest stays above the door. Okay. The car has started, correct? Yes, sir. This, at this point, would be Officer Tenzing's left hand, correct? Correct. And he, he's about at the side where the, where the A post is, roughly. So he has moved from the beginning of this at the B pillar all the way up to the A post. He's moved, yes, he's moved toward the, the A pillar. And that hand, that left hand of his appears in that, in that frame to be grabbing either Sam DeBose's chest or toward the seat belt, correct? Yes. Would that be indicative to you that he was grabbing, reaching, trying to grab something to keep from falling? I, I can't say what was in his mind. Well, the fact that he has moved from the B post up to the A post, uh, he's now facing more rearward, and he's grabbing at Sam the boat. So you can't draw any conclusions from that as to what's going on? That's a, a human factors question, and it's outside my area of expertise. Um, I can provide timing and positioning, and, I, and I, I, I don't want to say what I think was in Officer Tensing's mind. Perfect. Because you don't know. I, I do not know. This is an image, I assume, of the gun, correct? Correct. So the, the gun, if you go back one, but you don't have to, the gun comes into the image 1.17 seconds after the right hand came off the top of the car. So everything that we've just looked at now occurs in that 1.1 seconds. And is it your testimony that the car has not moved at this point? The car has not moved, yes. Can you tell from this? 
how, whether Mr. Officer Tenzi has come closer to the car. He has come closer to the car, yes. Do you know why? Um, no, I, I, he's moved closer to the car because he's moved closer to the car. The car, is, the car is not in motion, so he has moved closer to the car. Well, if the car had moved to the left slightly, you haven't accounted for that, have you? Yeah, the car has not moved. Period. Period. Can you tell where Officer Tenzing is with reference to the, the top of that car, for instance? I mean, and what I'm trying to ask you is, can you tell whether he's beginning to go down, fall? Well, the, the, the camera is above the, the door. His head is 13 inches above that. He is reaching into the vehicle, which would cause his chest, his, his legs would necessarily have had to move, but they could have. As he moves in, the camera comes toward the vehicle. So um, it's the camera that's moving toward the vehicle. We have the free hand, we have the free gun hand, and he's moving into the vehicle. Okay. That's what the video shows us. Well, we, we know we don't see the top of the, the car as we did previously with the, the body-worn camera, correct? Correct, because of the bend forward. And we've established that that 13 inches you keep referring to is plus or minus some inches, depending on the position of the, whether the shirt has moved, whether the head has moved. If Officer Tensing is standing erect, that's the distance. If he crouches, moves forward, there would be some change. Can you tell whether he's standing erect here or not? I would say he's not standing erect. He's, he's tall. The, the camera would have been higher up. He's now moving up in the image. Okay. And, and here we see Sam DeBose's left arm, correct? Correct. And here we see Ray Tenzing's left arm. Again, that makes you get Are all these little squares, is that the predictive stuff you talked about that's filled in from other frames? No, no. Each one of those is an 8 by 8 macro block of pixels. So 64 pixels make up each of those squares. It's called discrete cosine transform. It's just the way that these images are made up. When there's motion blur, they will be more apparent in some areas because the compressor is trying to figure out what's happening. In this image, we now see, rather than the roof of the car, the interior yes. roof of the car, correct? Yes. Can you tell what position Officer Tenzin in is in for the camera to capture that, that view? I can compare it to the previous image. So he has come up in the image. So this is... Um, the, the camera on his chest is now at about the center of the window. His head would be slightly over that, possibly over the, 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 the car. Um, Can I interrupt you? Yes, sir. Could his head also be cocked? No, because his shoulder is in view, so it doesn't have a lot of movement. So the, the shoulder gives us perspective of where the camera is. He's also very, and, very close to the car. Definitely. Yes, and, and the gun is, is here. So we've got, the, the camera is sort of at the center. We've got the shoulder, so we know his head is above the shoulder and to the right. So, so he's not moving over. Okay, and at this point, can you tell from that image what Sam DeBose is doing? His uh, left arm is up on about a 45 degree angle. Uh, his hand is partially open. He, his face is turned toward the officer. Um, that's a, an accurate representation of what's happening at that moment. He is consciously looking toward Ray Tenzin. Well, he, his face is, is turned toward the officer. We can't see his eyes here. He hasn't been shot, correct? That's correct. And you can't see what, can you see in that image what he's doing with his right I believe it's moving up to the steering wheel. Okay, at this point, stop. The gun comes into view, correct? Yes. And Ray Tenzing's finger is not on the trigger, correct? Can you tell that from that yeah. image? You, you can't really tell. There's a, this image hasn't been reproduced very well. 
Um, this has gone through a nonlinear editor. As a result, there's been a bit of smudging, but right above the trigger, so inside the trigger guard, there is a little bit of off coloration of, of color in what I'm looking at. Yes, right there. That that is consistent with a finger. Not my opinion. His fingers in the trigger guard, but it's very close. And do you you were a police officer in Vancouver? Correct? Yes. Were you always taught to keep your hand on the slide or your finger? trigger finger on the slide as opposed to on the trigger unless you intended to discharge the yes. weapon. So could you characterize that as Ray Tenzing being in control of his weapon at that point? Yes. Please go forward. Okay, stop there. Mr. Fredericks, can you tell us anything about Ray Tenzing's positioning at this point? Uh, yes, he's at, still at the A post. Um, his, uh, the camera is tilted downward. Um, he still maintains the contact with um, DeBose's chest, and the gun is still above the camera, below um, uh, the officer's eyes. And would you agree with me that there is no interior roof view there? I do. Would that be... Would that indicate that Ray Tenzing is lower than he was in the prior it would photograph where the interior roof was visible? Well, it indicates that the, the perspective of the camera has changed because it is tilting downward. Um, the camera itself has come downward um, a few inches. And he is now looking more rearward than into the interior of the car. Do you agree with that? No, this is a 130 degree view, so the center of the body is still facing uh, into the interior of the vehicle. When, when you turn on a 130 degree wide view, the outside of the image um, moves quicker than the inside. It's basically because of the contour. That's why, we, that's why I corrected it, but in this image with the distortion, you're getting a little bit of an odd perspective. So the camera is because of 180 degree, we're picking up the left, the right hand side is looking down the roadway, not to the side of the roadway, but the majority of the image is still in the interior of the car. But it's still, you would agree, rotated more rearward than when he started out. It, this, in this image, yes. Please go. Stop right in here. The last couple of images in this image would indicate that Ray Tenzing was extremely close to that car, correct? And moving upward, yes. And what does it say, or what does it tell you by the fact that here is the door sill, here is his left hand, um, he's that close. Can you tell where the rest of his body is? He's leaning into the car. The camera is still just outside the car above the door, but very close to it. So he is leaning in at that point. And, and the, so his chest is not inside the car, just slightly outside, but leaning over the car door. And you can't say whether he's falling at that point? The, the, this is prior to the shot occurring. At this one image, we can't say very much as we move forward. We get more perspective as the as he moves up in the image and and uh, um, kind of moves toward the center of the door. So in this particular image, the position of the arm doesn't go down. The camera goes down. So the arm here, if he were falling, would be going down. It doesn't, it stays in that position. From this perspective, and I'm holding my hand where the camera is, and I'm holding my arm out like Officer Tensing is. As I move forward, it's the perspective of the camera that goes downward toward the door as he goes in. If he were falling, the arm would be going down. We're not seeing that. You would agree with me that this isn't like a uh college football game or professional football game where you've got 10 different cameras looking at the same thing? Yes. And would you agree with me that even if you have 10 different cameras looking at the same thing, oftentimes it's difficult to tell what happened? Could be. 
Please go forward. Let me ask you this, Mr. Fredericks. Is the car in motion at this point? I'd have to look at my timing to look at my image because I'm not sure exactly where we are in the timing. Let's go forward some more. Okay, stop. Now this is again before the, the gunshot, correct? Yes. We see the interior roof of the car. Yes. We see Officer Tenzing's hand, left hand, which appears to be holding on to the seat belt, correct? Yes. And Sam DeBose's right arm would appear to be on the steering wheel? Appears to be, yes. And his left forearm is now up over his head, correct? Yes. And it would appear that he is looking forward yes. at something, correct? His face is, he is faced forward, yes. Such as he's driving the car to avoid the car that's parked in front of him, perhaps. I don't know what's in his mind at that time. Can you tell from the, the background here that the car is in motion at that point? I think this is where I am able to say that it appears the car is in motion. I, I'd have to look at my images, but I, I don't disagree with you here. I think that's what I said at this particular image. Can you tell what the, the position of the rest of Ray Tenzing's body is at that point? Yes. He, he is still closer to the A post than the B post. The camera is about centered in the window. Uh, the uh, gun is above the camera. Um, Let me interrupt. Can you see the gun in this, this image? Yes. Um, stand back here. This would be the gun right in here? No, that's his hand. Go up to the center top. Yes, that's the gun. And, and the... Okay, okay. I, I, this is his forearm. Yes. Wrist is cocked slightly. Yeah, so that's his watch, I believe. The first okay. black up and down object. Right here? Yes, sir. And then further, there will be the, that, that would be the barrel, yes. Okay, and is that the... The uh, grip. Grip? Okay. Yes. Go forward, please. And at this point, this is the interior of the roof, correct? Yes. This is the left hand of Ray Tenzing. Yes. Still holding the seat belt? Yes. Sam DeBose is still on the steering wheel? Yes. And can you tell anything from the, the angle here of the background? Yes. What is going on with Ray Tenzing? Yes. The, the, the camera has turned to the left, causing the horizon to go upward. Such as it might do if he was falling? Well, if we were falling, he would be getting lower. We're just seeing a turn. So if I, it doesn't take very much, so I'll just use my mouse here. If I do this, the horizon changes. So this movement would cause the horizon to do this. Falling movement would cause the horizon to go up, and we're not seeing that. Well, if you're falling to the side, as you just demonstrated, um, or being twisted and, and starting to fall, to the side, that would be exactly what's depicted there, correct? Well, we would see the changes in, in the arms. They would be doing something different as well. Would you agree with me that that's the B pillar? Yes. Thank you, sir. Please go forward. Stop right there. Mr. Fredericks, would you agree that this is Ray Tenzing's forearm? Yes. Would you agree that it's up like this? It's above the camera. No, I, I don't agree with that. No. Could you, I'll tell you, could you lower your arm? No, lower it and point it at me. Like that? Yes. Okay. About like that. So the fact that this image depicts it up like this with a hand, wrist cocked down with the gun sticking out the end of it, mm -hmm. you're saying he's standing up? Saying that the center of his chest is at the center of the window. His left arm is positioned um, to the left of this, not below it. And the gun is in line with directly above the camera, which gives some 
linear perspective of where the chest, head, and eyes would be. Can we agree to disagree? Yes, sir. Thank you. Please go forward. Okay, again, these images that we're seeing, this is at the time the shot is fired, correct? It's after the shot is fired, yes. Okay, and again, Officer Tenzing's forearm is depicted here? Yes. And his wrist is cocked? Yes. At a downward angle, correct? Correct. Thank you. Please go forward. And at this point, can you tell he's... Officer Tenzing would appear to be right up next to the car, correct? Yeah, now at this point, notice how the left arm is now on this angle. So it's, and what I'm doing is I'm raising my elbow in the pers kind of perspective of the image itself. Can you just go back one, where we were for a second? Yeah. The camera is now getting closer to the B post. The um, elbow is raised up on the angle, not the way it was before. The background has changed. The vehicle is now in motion. Officer Tenzing has released his grip. His forearm is now on the uh, uh, window top. Yes. And his hand, as we'll see as we move forward, his hand will, become, will come close to the B post. And before we go forward, the angle doesn't appear to be flat. It appears to be up and down. Correct, yes. Why is that? That's, that's because he is now, after the shot, going down. So what's happened is he has, um, the, the car has now moved forward. Uh, he has moved downward. He's released. His elbow is now um, resting on the car. And it's about in line with where his chest is. We can see the, the perspective. So the camera is about where the hand is, which is at the door. So he is now moving downward. We're getting an upward perspective. Okay. And you said his elbow is now resting on the car? Well, his, his forearm is on the, the door. Such as this? So, similar to that. Or is it more like he's clinging on? More like that. Like what I just did last? Yes. Thank you. Please go. And now it's, it would appear to me, I'm not the expert, but it would appear to me that he's beginning to, to fall to the ground, correct? Off the side of the car? He is, yes, he is, the hand is above the camera. He is now um, slightly below the, the level, the camera is slightly below the level of the door. And he's right at the B post, and we have an upward perspective. So the car is going by him as he's holding on. To the vehicle. The car, which well, car? Well, the, the, sorry, the, the Honda is in motion. It's moving, and he is, he is uh, um, the perspective of the camera is moving down the car as he's holding on. So the car is moving faster than he is, than the officer is moving. And do you know how the officer is moving at that point? Um, well, he's holding on to the car. Well, okay. Um, is he running with the car? At this point, I wouldn't think so, no. Is he walking with the car? No. But he is moving with the car. He is moving with the car. But you don't know how, he, how he's moving with the car. Well, I know that he is still in control of his firearm with his right hand. You can see his left hand on the car, uh, on the door. So I imagine he's applying some supportive force to maintain that position. So would you agree with me that he is attached to the car? Well, he's holding on to the car. That would be attached. Okay. Um, he, he is attached himself to the car. Would you agree with me that he is not moving of his own free will at that point? Um, I would agree with that. I think I understand your question. Um, in other words, he's not in control of what he's doing at that point. I would agree with that. Okay. Please go forward. Now at this point, you can stop. It appears that he is grabbing on to the, the B post, correct? I would agree with that. I wouldn't I wouldn't disagree. I don't know if he has a grip, but his thumb is there and it's his hand is over. This is this is a fleeting 
event. We're looking at frame by frame. It's, in the, it's a fleeting event. Um, so I don't know if he actually was able to grab or not. But, but it would appear that that's what he's attempting to do. I, I think he's, well, I, I don't want to speak for him, for him I'll, but. I'll, I'll not ask you. Either. Yeah, it's consistent with attempting to gain some kind of control as, as the car is moving. Thank you. And along this side of the, the of Mr. DeBose's car, I assume that would be Officer Kenzing's cruiser? It is. And it's obvious from that that Mr. DeBose's car has moved from the position where it originally stopped. Right? Yes, and we can see through the back window that vehicle that had been parked there is now in that different position. So we absolutely know the vehicle has moved since the shot was fired. Would it be safe for me to say that at this point, that's Officer Lyndon Schmidt the kid's vehicle back there? It is. Thank you. Please go forward. And now, now Ray Tenzing is down below the plane of the window. Is that a fair statement? Yes, he's released the, his, if we called it grip, his hand is just coming off at this point, and the car is going by. Is that part of Ray Tenzing there? Yes. What is that? I, I think that's part of his hand. Okay. Um, he's away from the beat though, correct? Yes. Please go forward. Stop. Can you go back one thing? Okay. Um, this is the side of Sam DeBose's car, correct? Yes. What is this right here? Left foot, right foot. Okay, and what's that right there? That's the rear left wheel of the vehicle. So, Sam DeBose's car was that close to Ray Tenzing when he fell off the car, correct? Yes. Please go forward. And what is, what is happening in here? Camera's pretty much looking straight up as, as Officer Tensing goes to the ground. How would the camera capture photographs of his, of his feet if it's not movable, such as you described? Because his body was turned toward the feet as he's coming off the car, and then when he goes backward, the visualization of the camera comes up. Please go forward. Can you explain, stop right there? What is this? This is his face in the image. How did that camera, if it doesn't move, look up Ray Tenzing's nose? We have a lot of activity as he goes to the ground. Obviously, he's brought his head forward as he's going backward, and that would cause him to be within that. It's a wide-angle lens. We have 130 degrees, so it's capturing part of his, his, his nose and upper head. And are you able to say what that is? Yes, uh, that is the driver's mirror of uh, the DeBose vehicle, and on the right-hand side is the other vehicle that is driving by at the same time. My, my perspective from back here is a little different. Um, this would be the no parking sign that's out there, correct? Correct. And is that the vehicle you're referring to? Yes, so they're both driving by each other at the same moment. That's the audio question that we would have had. And Ray Tenzing is in between, correct? Yes. Please go forward. Okay, and here this this shows the, the vehicle going by much clearer. Yes. That, that's the car that was northbound on race. That's right. Okay. Please go forward. And now, can you tell what Officer Tenzing is doing? He is, this is where he begins to move to the right. I wouldn't necessarily call it a roll to the right, because he doesn't really roll over, he kind of just, he, this is a re part of the recovery, rolls to the right, stands up. And again, this is him continuing to adjust himself and pick himself up? Part of that process, yes. Side up, so to speak. 
and these images have been corrupted pretty poorly. I don't know exactly what's happened to them, but... Is that from copying too many times? No, it's the way it was produced for you. Um, but what we have here is this is where the, the vehicle in the background, in the original image, is much more clear. Um, it's coming to a stop. That's the vehicle that was going northbound. Um, is that what the, the red is in here? I, lights, perhaps? It might be. The, the image has not been accurately reproduced, but the, the gun is in his right hand, which we can see. Left hand is also there. This corresponds with uh, the lineishment uh, video, where we see him with his arms in front of himself, and he's getting off the ground. There, there's a clearer image. Yes, right? much better, yeah. Okay. And this again is the no parking sign. Yes. And can you tell from that image uh, how Officer Kimsing has his trigger finger at that point? No. Does he appear to be in control of his weapon? He, he's maintained control of his weapon, yes. Please go for it. Can you tell? from that photograph or that image where his finger is on with reference to the slide of the gun or the trigger? No. He's good for it. Let me stop for a minute. Would you agree with me that that's the no parking sign? Yes. And this whole event started out down north of that, correct? Down yeah. the hill? Yes. And now would you agree that Officer Tenley is beginning to turn and look southbound toward the direction Sam DeBose was headed? Yes. And would you agree that that's Sam DeBose's car at that point? I... Maybe go forward a couple of it. it might have been, yes. Okay. Um, please go forward. Stop right there. Would you agree that this is the silver car that was parked I in do. front of Sam DeVos where he where the traffic stop was initiated? Yes. And this up here would be Sam DeVos's car? Yes. Can you tell whether that is before or after he struck the garden? Yeah. I believe it's after. And this is after Officer Tenzing regains his feet? Yes. And begins to run up the hill? Here. Yes. Mr. Fredericks, would you agree with me that somehow Ray Tenzing ended up farther south on Rice Street from where he started out in his encounter with Stephen Rose? Yes. And you would agree with me that this video, body-worn camera video, is but one piece of evidence in this entire situation? Yes. And you would agree with me that you have no idea what Ray Tenzing was thinking or perceiving or what other stimulations he was receiving during the course of this? Yes. Thank you. There's no doubt in your mind from your analysis that that car, Sam DeBose's car, had moved prior to the gunshot being fired, correct? Correct. Would you agree that this was a rapidly evolving occurrence? Yes. Would you agree with me that Anybody watching it could perceive and see different things? Um, I think that, that yes, the, anybody watching this video would have a perspective based on many things, and that perspective may not be shared by everybody. For instance, officers Lyndon Schmidt and Kidd, who arrived right as it was occurring, 
testified that they heard squealing tires and then a gunshot, which would indicate the car was in motion. They are mistaken about the squealing tires because that would have been recorded at the camera. They might have heard squealing tires somewhere else. The camera would record, we would have a reproduction of that audio, a lot more likely than they would be able to hear it because of the proximity of the car. They may have heard squealing tires that the camera didn't hear that was not in the area of the camera. You're not suggesting they're lying? Absolutely not, no. And Alicia Napier, who was in that silver car depicted there, indicated in her testimony, among other things, that she heard a gunshot and then the car moved. Correct, and I think that's consistent with the video. Gunshot, then hearing the car move. The car moving, I thought you testified the car moved before the gunshot. I'm sorry, sir, what you said to me was she heard a gunshot, then the car moved. That was what she heard. I agreed with that. And you wouldn't call her a liar if she said that the car moved after the gunshot, would you? The car did move after the gunshot, I agree with that. But it was moving at the time the gunshot occurred also, correct? It had, for about 1.1 seconds, I believe there was motion forward. Pardon me, 0.9 seconds is the timing between the time we know the car has not been moving to the shots fired. Somewhere in there, we know the car started to move. So I guess if I just heard all that correctly, the car was in motion when the gunshot was fired, correct? That is correct. And if Alicia Napier testified it was not in motion when the gunfire occurred, she misperceived the situation, correct? This is the woman driving toward the vehicle? No, this is the woman who was seated in the silver car watching through her rear view mirror. I don't think that she would necessarily be incorrect from that perspective because the forward motion would have been very, very short. So I don't think that from her perspective she would have been able to perceive the motion forward, so I wouldn't say she's inaccurate or that her observation was inaccurate. Would you agree with me that everybody from every different viewpoint would perceive things differently? That's why we have this record that gives us an unbiased perspective of what occurred. And you also keep referring to forward motion. There was also motion to the left, correct, of that car? I don't think it would have been measurable, but there would be some, there would have to be some movement toward the center of the roadway as the vehicle moved forward, but probably not measurable within that, between the time it started to move and the shot fired. Somehow the car had to turn left to get around Alicia Napier's car parked there, correct? I do not agree with that, no. That implies a turning as the car is moving as opposed to just going straight. When I examined where the cars were, that perception of where the impact was could have been a straightforward movement if the wheels were canted slightly. Also, we're going uphill, so if the wheels are turned, the resistance would cause that turn to increase just because of the nature of the hill and the movement of the tires. That's pure speculation on your part. That is correct, yeah, I would agree with that. Were you able to determine in your analysis how far Ray Tenzing moved up or up the hill from the point where the traffic stop started, where he was stationary with Sam DuBose at the side of his car to the point where he disengaged from it and was getting up as we just saw? From the point of the shot or the point right before the shot at the B post or A post? Well, I guess those are different because the car was in motion at the point of the shot, correct? It had moved. We have a number of different variables. We have the first position where he is first engaged standing behind the B post. He then moves to a position just by the A post, so conceivably a couple of feet. Vehicle still not in motion. Then we have the activity, and in that last second of time, as the vehicle begins to move, he doesn't go downward, so he is moving in that couple of feet. Then he turns to the right, and he is moving in that last second of time. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. The case has been well briefed and argued. We'll take it under advisement.
couple of feet, I don't know if his body uh, changes, shifts balance or it actually takes a step, but there is a movement forward with the vehicle in that 0.9 seconds before the shot's fired. So from that position to where he came off the vehicle. That's a good spot. How, okay. How far? From that position, I, I believe it was around 24 feet in that area, 20 to 24 feet. And, and that's where, not where he landed, but where he rolled and then was beginning to stand up. So I don't know how far that would take a person, you know, um, of his size to go down, turn, roll, and then get up. There'd be some distance that would be added to, to equate to that 24 feet. I don't know where he came off the vehicle, is my point. But you would, pardon me, would agree with me that it was further south on Rice Street from where he started out? Oh, yes. Mr. Fredericks, uh, before I end, first of all, we can all agree that you weren't there when this happened, correct? Correct. Before I sit down here, and I'm finished, but before I sit down here, if you play the clip of the incident one more time, in actual time, real time? Yes. And, and from where to where, sir? Um, <clears throat> pardon me, from the point where Officer Tenzing is reaching to open the door to the point where the shot is fired or there after. Yes. Step your leg. Why is it turning off? Go ahead and take your seatbelt off for me. Go ahead and take your seatbelt off. Stop! Sounds about right. And I've been up here, I don't know how long I've been up here, but yesterday, Mr. Graff and Reed questioned you for some period of time and again this morning. And we've spent literally two or three hours, I would think, talking about something that happened in less than three seconds. Yes. Would you agree with me that what we've done is, has just been engaging in 2020 hindsight? No, this is forensics. Thank you. I have nothing. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Mr. Matthews made a statement that um, the defendant was holding on to the car. He's not moving of his his own free will. Do you remember that statement? Yes. Now, isn't it true at that point, Mr. DeBose is already dead? Yes. And so he is not controlling the car. Or he's already been shot in the head. Yes. So we can't say whether. But he's already been shot in the head, and so he is not in control of the car. As best we know. That's what my understanding is, yes. Okay. So all of the... Um, I can do it here. Okay, can you okay? Yes. Go right back. Thank you. Where would you like to go? Just right, right before the shots fired. Yes. And then play from the shots fired, um, and I'm going to be able to clip through. Um, play from right before the first stop of the shot fired, I'm sorry. From um, where he's about to say, take off your seatbelt to the shots fired? Yes. You can figure out if you have a license, license or not. Go ahead and take your seatbelt off for me. Go ahead and take your seatbelt. Stop! Stop! Yes, it's my understanding. And at this point, it's 
you were testing me that how far had the car moved? Based on, on this position at the A post where we last saw the car not in motion to the moment of the shot, the movement is a couple of feet. And then there's one th other thing I want to clarify. Uh, Mr. Matthews played you um, a video and you were talking about the the timing and so forth. Can you explain, when you did your timing, what were the different rates that you found, you know, between image and image? The refresh rate from image to image, because it's a variable, ranges from 25 milliseconds to 131 milliseconds, as opposed to 30 frames per second. So that was carefully examined in my timing. And then when you present the does that keep the timing consistent? Well, when I'm doing it frame by frame, that keeps the timing consistent. When I played it here, I've done my best. This uh, Using QuickTime will read those time delays and should represent it relatively closely. But the timing that I have is, is precise. Okay. And I think you said that your process can be repeated over and over, and is that also peer reviewed? Yes. It, it, that process, um, it's, a, it's a forensic process that is repeatable because all the settings are saved, yes. And that process has undergone lots of peer review. Thank you. I have no further questions. Thank you. Anything on uh, recross? No, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. Mr. Fredericks, you're able to step down to this time, and I believe you're excused, or do you need him to stay? That'll be fine, Judge. Okay, thank you.